First, let me thank Janek that he joined me, uh, which is the great advantage because he deals with uh, minimum wage. Uh, he's been dealing for ages, I think, and this will contribute you to... overestimate my age, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as to, uh, as to the comment, first is uh, the comment on uh, the two sessions in general. I think that uh, the organizers, Piotr in particular, uh, has chosen the, the, the topics very well. So we had, uh, we had a, kind of a set of presentations which uh, give us a look on the issue from different viewpoints. So the first presentation was from a more or less general uh, perspective, the second one from the point of view of a comparative European perspective, uh, the third one was on, a, on the particular country case, uh, partially typical, partially specific, uh, namely the Polish case. Then we had a general overview of uh, the issue from the point of view of the developing countries and the last, the fifth session, the fifth presentation was on the country specific, country very far away from, from the place where we are now, but still very interesting and giving us a kind of uh, insight which is uh, partially different from what we usually observe, but this complement the general view. So thanks, Piotr, for choosing this, this uh, not only this particular presentation for presentation today, but also for choosing the, the structure of them. Uh, as to the the issue in general, <coughs> well, the minimum wage is a concept which has a long tradition. So it's not a newly, uh, newly invented uh, interven institutional intervention to the labor market. So we have a long history and a lot of ideas behind. So uh, what we apply now is a set of methods and approaches that, have, that had been developed a long time ago. Uh, some of them f still fit our reality today, some of them are outdated. And I would like to stress this uh, as my, my important comment that well, the 20th century and the 21st century, the two centuries, they differ from each other, they strongly differ. So even if something was appropriate for the situation uh, a couple of decades ago, it does not necessarily fit the problems we face now. Uh, these problems are different for, uh, for many reasons, uh, but the most important one is the one I deal with. Maybe it's why I'm overestimating, but I hope it's not overestimation, which is the demographic change. Uh, so I I I the labor market looked differently in 20th century and it looks differently today. And this change is not a kind of fluctuation, it's a kind of long-term uh, long-term change which, uh, which should uh, suggest us at least to, to um, critically revise uh, what is the history of minimum wage and to think of the challenges of the future. Uh, but the goals, they remain the same. So uh, w what I meant is that the reality changed methods are good or not, or efficient or inefficient, or less efficient today, but the goals stay unchanged. And I think that the key goal is to, to protect the disadvantaged, uh, those who can be treated unfair, uh, and partially those who have been treated unfair by, by nature, so their productivity is, is, is the lowest in the society. So we have two choices. First is uh, to, uh, to protect against exploitation. Second is to help those who cannot help themselves, even if they are not uh, treated unfairly. So we have these two goals, and the question is whether the methods we apply today uh, are efficient or not. And I have many doubts, and well, the doubts are well known. Actually, the, uh, the issue is, uh, is a kind of textbook issue, and there's a lot of textbooks uh, arguments for the minimum wage and against the, uh, the, the minimum wage. Uh, the, the minimum wage. Mm, so now uh, the question is uh, how can we reach the goals, unchanged goals in the changed world. And here I would like to stress the most uh, uh, the situation of the, of the young, of those who are newcomers to the labor market. 
Uh, their situation today is much worse in comparison to the situation we observed a couple of decades ago. So the, <clears throat> the generation of newcomers today, they cannot enjoy the same situation as was the case for their parents. So this is the, the big change, and we see this uh, in, in many, many places, including the Occupy uh, movement uh, in Europe, not only in Europe, in OECD countries. Uh, the young, they, they, they want to be treated the same as the previous generation, but we know this cannot be the case. Why? Because of the demographic change. Uh, so the situation changed. So applying the minimum wage, does it help the young or not? Uh, so here we had a couple of examples <coughs> of, uh, of policies that differenti differentiate uh, the minimum wage by groups. And what matters the most, at least from my viewpoint, uh, is to have a special approach for, uh, for the youngsters, for those who try to enter the labor market for the first time. And here we have two problems. The first one, we need to have the minimum wage lower for them, and at the same time, we need to protect them against using this minimum wage being lower against their further employment. So we have a lot of uh, examples of unfair treatment of the youth because of this regulation. So here it's a kind of challenge for us, a kind of institutional challenge. Uh, we would like to apply the minimum wage, but this should be done in a way which actually helps the young instead of making the year situation more difficult. Uh, my next comment uh, is actually related to the demographic change. Uh, the comment is very sad. Uh, typically, not only in this room, uh, we present our analysis in terms of crisis. The pre-crisis, crisis, or hopefully post-crisis situation. Well, I think that what we observe now is only partially a result of the crisis, uh, but it's mostly the result of a kind of downward shift of a long-term trend. So <clears throat> good times will not come again. So well, the, the better has already been. Uh, so for the future, we need to find something which is not um, looking for better times. So just looking for a kind of bridge to the better times. I think we need to look at methods which will be applicable in bad times, in, in uh, permanently difficult times. So this is a change of the challenge from the past. So in the 20th century, we had a number of fluctuations and we have a lot of methods which help us to cope with uh, problems stemming from, uh, from fluctuations. But we don't have methods that can be applied uh, after the change of the trend. And this change of the trend is something uh, uh, very sad. So, well, but still we, we, we need to, to leave and to find uh, ideas. Uh, next comment relates to the, the example of the Netherlands, so which is actually a very promising one. So I really like this example. And, well, I don't like, uh, sorry, I don't know details, but uh, the outcome is great. So they, those who are the young, they, they are not uh, pushed out from the market because of the deregulation, but they are somehow absorbed. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is something really good. I also like the idea of the single contract. We discussed this, uh, this idea yesterday, and this is something promoted very much uh, by Piotr and IBS in Poland. Uh, I think this is a kind of a solution, maybe not an ideal one, but well, the one which in the current circumstances can help. So the question is what to do with uh, the situation that people are not the same. So actually part of the, mm, of the challenge we have is the fact that <coughs> in the past, labor was more or less homogeneous. And the, the assumption that labor is, was homogeneous was close to reality, while today labor is heterogeneous. So applying anything which is covering entire population is uh, inefficient by definition. So we need to find things which are well targeted to, uh, to groups and especially to, to those who are newcomers to the market. Uh, presenting the case of Poland, uh, Piotr presented uh, once again, but this is something really 
striking to me that we have two worlds in the labor market in Poland. So, well, we have employment contracts and civil contracts. And the two worlds are really different from each other. And this duality is, is something which will be very difficult for us in Poland in, in the years to come. Uh, well, I also like um, what we observe uh, in the presentation that we need two types of diversification of approaches. The first one is to see that what, uh, is, um, what is typical for the OECD countries is not necessarily typical for uh, outside OECD countries. So we, we need, well, it would be a mistake to apply OECD tested methods in non-OECD countries. That could lead to, to a lot of, uh, of, of problems. And the second, uh, second uh, approach, which is not discussed today, which has not been discussed today, is this time-specific uh, time uh, approach. So what was good in the 20th century is not necessarily good for the 21st century. And that we did not discuss, and it's my suggestion in general to all of us to keep thinking in terms of forward-looking challenges rather than in uh, focusing only on the analysis of the methods applied in the 20th century. Well, maybe now, uh, Janek, you probably more. Thank, thank you, Marek. Uh, I must say that I have just learned that I'm going to, to give comments virtually a minute before Piotr announced this, so <laughs> please forgive me, my comments will not be very well structured. And what I'm planning to do is just to talk about two things. One, to try to recap the messages that I think are the most important, the most policy relevant from all presentations that I've heard. And second, to just talk a little bit about the, what I see as a political economy of the minimum wage setting, which I think is quite, quite important and was not discussed. And I would like to, to see the presenter's view and your views on, on, the, on the dynamics of the minimum wage setting. So as far as the messages are concerned, I think for everybody, uh, the first message is that the increase in the minimum wage, provided that, is no, that the minimum wage is not very, very high, has virtually very little effect on overall employment. This is not surprising to everybody who has studied the minimum wage determination, but it still, I think, is a message that is not very well absorbed among people who are active, in especially on the employer side, because you know, whenever there is a, a discussion about the minimum wage increase, there's always this uh, this voice that you know this will have a very detrimental, deleterious effect on employment, and all research results basically say that this is not the case on the overall, on the aggregate level. But I think the, also the lesson that we have learned is that there are some sectors and some worker groups that will be affected. You know, the example of South African agriculture is very striking, so this needs to be taken into account. That there are some sectors that are much more vulnerable and to which the aggregate results do not necessarily apply. And there are also some groups that are much more vulnerable, and Marek stresses and all presenters that youth and low-skilled workers are particularly affected. And also in countries with uh, large regional differences, again, you not, I mean, there is a tendency to look at the average effects, but it, what is not an, a, a significant effect it, in regions that are well-developed may be a very strong effect in less developed regions. So I think uh, in Poland we, we, have, we have had this discussion about regional differentiation, differentiation of the minimum wage. Poland is quite a heterogeneous country, but it has never actually, um, the idea has never been accepted. Uh, we also had a youth sub minimum, and for unexplained minimum, uh, reason it was, it was abolished uh, a few years ago. Uh, so I think these are, these are important issues. The second finding that I found important and a little bit new to me, I must say, although I have studied the minimum wage setting, was what Andrea has said. And I like the, tit the title is excellent. You know, the, the strong, uh, strong teeth, sharp teeth, is not necessarily a, a full mouth. It can, you can end up in, with an empty mouth. And I think this is a highly policy relevant message that if you have a, a high bite of the minimum wage, a high minimum wage relative to the average wage, you may end up with a large proportion of people who are not covered. So the, the actual effect is, is not, not the, the desired one. Uh, the third finding that I think should be taken into consideration by policymakers is that the minimum wage is not an effective anti-poverty tool. That, and 
This is important because it is usually in, in, in public debate, in policy debate, people say we need to increase the minimum wage to prevent poverty, to especially poverty among uh, working uh, people, but also poverty in general. But evidence shows that, at least in the context of uh, middle to high income countries, uh, people who are poor are not necessarily those people who are in the labor market. They are out of the labor market. Sometimes they are self-employed or employed in agriculture, so the minimum wage policy does not reach them. And also people who earn the minimum wage very often are not poor. They are in, either in the middle of the income distribution or in the, even in the upper ends of the income distribution. And I found this result not only for Poland and for the OECD countries, but also in Georgia and Armenia, countries with much lower levels of income. So when discussing the minimum wage policy, it's very important to look at the income distribution and actually what drives poverty. Is it wages? Is it the number of earners? And who are people who Mm, who earn the, the, the minimum wage. They often are secondary earners in uh, well-to-do families. So this is a very strong argument, and I think Hervig and Andrea made this quite clear that it's not an effective uh, anti-poverty tool. You need to use different in instruments to address poverty rather than just the minimum wage. Not, do not expect too much from the minimum wage. And the final point and the final finding that I think is important to emphasize, which is much less often made, and I think that was emphasized in your presentation, Andrea, is the link between the minimum wage increase and productivity. Uh, and the reason, no, it was Piotr or? No, it was, no. It was Michal, probably. Michal. Oh, Michael, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, and I would like to focus a little bit on this, especially in the context of Poland, because there is a lot of discussion now. I mean, there is a feeling that Poland is caught in this uh, middle income trap. And there are very influential policy proposals that, in a way, in order to escape this middle income trap, Poland needs to increase wages. And incre to increase the minimum wage is one way of doing so. And the, the, the reasoning is that if we have higher wages, this will force employers to invest more in physical capital, workers and employers to invest more in, in training and education, and this somehow in a magic way, but just by increasing wages, will move us to, to the uh, higher income countries group. I think this is a very dangerous logic, and I think the evidence that, that we have is that if you increase the minimum wage, indeed productivity increases, but for a very different reasons. It's not because you invest in productivity, but because basically you lock low productivity workers out of employment. They lose their jobs, they are not employed, they are not hired because their productivity is too low. So it's a very different mechanism, and actually quite different from the one that we would like to achieve by increasing the minimum wage. And so that's, that's in, uh, all in terms of, of uh, summarizing the, the, the findings that I find, uh, think are the, the most important and policy relevant. And now some concerns, which I, to some extent, share with Mare Gura. Uh, what I think is important is, is, is the political economy, as I mentioned at the beginning. And there is a number of factors here. There is a Council of Europe, uh, its uh, charter, social charter, which says that the minimum wage should be set at the level of 60% of the average wage. And in a number of countries that I'm working on, like in South Caucasus, they treat this as a binding actually constrained as a, as a recommendation that they have to do so, which is not the case, but that's, that's the impression among uh, some policy makers. There's a lot of political pressure you know, for countries to, to adopt this. And this is immediately taken up by trade unions. They say, okay, the Council of Europe said this, and we need to have a minimum wage, which is 60% of the average wage. And when I'm using the argument that basically the majority of countries have lower minimum wage, out of 27 or 28 European countries, only 20, uh, only six, I guess, have the minimum wage at this level, and some of them differentiate. This actually is not uh, well, well taken. Uh, so there is a lot of forces that have incentives to, to increase the minimum wage, uh, uh, different stakeholders. And I would also like to, to emphasize this in the context of the notion of the European minimum wage. It's okay if you mean by this that you, you need to have, every country needs to have a relative minimum wage, which is, let's say, 50% of the, of the median world, uh, wage. That will not do much damage. But some people, like, like Juncker, uh, they say, you know, there should be just uniform minimum wage. And I found a very interesting slide, again, I think it was in your presentation, on how unions react to, to, to having a uniform minimum wage. 
I think it's important to look at unions in poorer countries of Europe, like, like Poland and other new member states, and in richer countries, and the same to look, to look at the perception of employers. And what I found is, it's just, you know, this was a mental experiment, uh, uh, just a thought experiment, that with an exception, all of these parties have strong incentive to advocate for a uniform minimum wage uh, for the whole Europe. If you look at trade unions, trade unions in richer countries are very much afraid and concerned about what they call social dumping. That, you know, countries compete by lower costs, like Poland or the Czech Republic, the Republic, they have lower wage costs, so they are competitors. So it's clearly in their interest to increase the minimum wage in, in the competitor countries. When you look at employers, it's the same, because that gives them competitive edge. It, that would give them, you know, or that would reduce the competitive edge of poorer countries if the minimum wage is set. If you look at unions in poorer European countries, they have the same incentive. That would be great if Polish workers earned the same minimum wage as the German workers or the French workers. So they have a clear incentive to advocate the increase in the, to, to have a uniform European minimum wage. And only employers, which are often, you know, the weaker part at the tripartite level, not at the company level, have a clear incentive to, to, to oppose the uniform minimum wage. So I think that's a, a dynamic which can be potentially dangerous, not, if, not, if not controlled for. And I think it's worth to, 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 to look at this process in more, in more detail. And finally, I have two comments on the presentation of my colleague from the World Bank, of Michael Weber. I understand this work in progress, so I think there is still room to to discuss some of the recommendations. Uh, there are two recommendations I have some problems with. One is that when, when you set a minimum wage, you need to use this notion of the living wage or a decent w uh, wage or take into account worker needs and the needs of families. That's the notion uh, heavily promoted by the ILO. Uh, and I think there is obviously a merit to it. But I, my argument is, and in my policy dialogue that I have with countries I, I work on is that first and foremost you need to look at the earnings distribution and to see what would be the proportion of workers affected by the increase in the minimum wage and that's very you know heavily dependent on the shape of the distribution so I think you can use this notion of the living wage and you need to take into account but the primary consideration is is not you know worker needs but you need to see what will be the effect of the increase in the minimum wage because if you have a country with a very unequal wage distribution and you cut deep into the distribution, your, actually your employment effect can be pretty large, as the example of, of uh, South Africa demonstrates. So I would reverse the, the priorities. You first say, you know, use the, the needs approach and then look at the distribution. I would say first look at the distribution and they s then see whether you can reconcile this with, with needs of workers and their families. Uh, and then, you know, there is this normative statement that stakeholders should represent general interest of the country. I think that's, that's very idealistic because usually stakeholders do not represent the general interest of the country. They, they, they represent their own narrow interests disregarding the general interest of the country. You cannot expect trade unions or employers, you know, at least in the settings that I'm familiar with, to have such a broad and, 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 and I don't know, general view of the effects of, of their interventions. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are running, a bit, running out of time a, li a little bit. We have like five minutes to lunch. And there are various reasons why we have to be on lunch. So let me just take two questions. Uh, we have to be on time with starting and finishing lunch. I will explain in a minute. So let me just take two questions. and. Uh, let me just take two questions. We already have two people. And the, of course, it's not very crowded right now, so you can talk over lunch uh, with all the, all the speakers. It's, you feel feel your, yourself invited. There. Thank you very much, Vladimir Boguslavsky. Uh, actually, I wanted to just to uh, like uh, turn your attention to two things. Most of consideration may be selected here and articles mostly refer to microeconomics somehow. And I think nobody touched the easy issue that minimal wage increases actually aggregate demand. 
And uh, this way we can increase actually employment uh, by, because uh, you see, I don't know how many people of you present in here actually were searching for the job uh, during the last three months uh, in Poland, for example, and in other countries. Uh, the situation is really grave. And uh, this is first consideration about macroeconomics, yeah? Nobody was talking about it, uh, about the aggregate case. I mean, if uh, someone is having uh, enough earning to, for housing and fooding, he doesn't have enough money to pay extra for some services that can be provided by other entrepreneurs, let's, let's say. And this is important uh, things in terms of minimal wage. Another thing is uh, just a little bit in terms of not more economics like ideology. How many people actually in government or people taking decisions are really concerned about employment level? It, because I think most of the people, uh, they have secured employment there in their offices and they do not consider it as a great problem. Uh, Marx's agenda is gone from consideration too. So we don't have any kind of ideological orientation. For example, to get, uh, I will not work myself for $2 an hour, but I have enough skills to find a job for people who will work under my guidance for $2. You see, and the question is, should I open a company, uh, employ people for $2 and have $2 profit from each of them I mean per hour, so is it uh, okay? So government doesn't have any obstacles in terms of uh, me doing this. Uh, like this is the issues I just uh, wanted to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like, maybe we'll, we'll get the second one and then we'll, we'll see if first. Just short comment. Uh, Stanisław Adamczyk, Warsaw School of Economics. In my opinion, we should think about um, effectiveness of the minimum wage in the current uh, macroeconomic situation. It is not a perfect tool of reducing uh, poverty and, and unemployment. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, think about uh, uh, the state as an uh, employer of the last resort. It is a perfect uh, tool to increase the bargaining power of the working class and uh, increase the minimum uh, level of the uh, earnings. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's how I interpret these or other comments and then questions to us uh, or to all presenters. Marcel? Please take the mic because the translation my, works. My then. question is more or less in line with uh, with Jan's uh, comment. Um, I think in the in the economics profession, there's more and more uh, uh, a sense of consensus that the minimum wage is a very poor instrument, not just to alleviate poverty but also to redistribute. And the idea is, you sh uh, this goes along with the with the last thing, how to set the level. Uh, uh, the appropriate thing that many people propose is you should look at. Uh, at living conditions, what is the minimum I need, and then you should obviously take into a care, uh, take into account whether you're cut into uh, the wage distribu distribution at a very high level, doing that or not. But um, in the recommendations, uh, it's clear that if you read the literature on minimum wages, this is all very mixed, right? Because you you are you're measuring employment effects uh, across countries where the kites in this is very different, uh, where there are different provisions. So I would have expected. Uh, a much clearer uh, stance of the international organizations on how to actually set them. So get away from simple rules like 60% of uh, uh, average wages, which will kill employment in, uh, in many countries, and give them clear indications about how to measure, uh, how, to, how to compute what is uh, a wage that affords uh, uh, a decent living, how to set up a minimum wage commission or a low pay uh, commission, give them tools to do that. I mean, I've, I think the uh, recommendations I've seen are as uh, unconclusive and dispersed and unguiding as the literature itself. Yes, may, may, if, if I may have a short comment uh, on the 
approach to setting the minimum wage. There was this conference on minimum wage in Berlin in March. You were there and Wimmer was, was there, I, I, I think. And uh, I think it was Peter Dalton from the UK uh, who made this comment that after the, the, the conference was just two weeks before the German parliament passed the law on introducing minimum wage next year. And <clears throat> we were discussing a lot about that there is no evaluation, no ex-ante evaluation of impacts, and we don't really know how the level will be set in Germany in the future, why 850 euros per hour. And uh, then there was the presentation by, 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 by Peter Dalton, I, I think, from, from the UK. In the UK, they have a special commission, works like a, like a monetary council, it is a minimum wage council. It's a little bit different from the council you have, because it's a not tripartite commission. It's, it doesn't have representative of unions, it's more like experts. It is a rot rotating chamber of people, which doesn't really have a, a power to make decision, but they make, recommend, they made recommend, they make recommendations for, for the government, and as far as we learned at this conference, the government mainly listens. Uh, but they also do evaluation studies, how, how the employment wa uh, minimum wage impacts the labor market and so on. There's an imp important comment at the end of the conference that both the, all the speakers from Germany, both the, let's say, ITSA speakers were, which were ICA speakers which were arguing that we should, that the minimum wage 8.50 per hour is way too high and both the trade union speakers which were arguing that 8.50 is enough or even or, or, or even too low, both these groups were using the UK system as a perfect example to justify their stance. So they were saying that we should set up the, we should set, we should treat the minimum wage and set the minimum wage like UK do, then we would understand and you put that it is too high or it is too low. So I think that at the end of the day it's gonna be political anyway and, and I completely agree with, with Marcel suggestion that perhaps if the, if the international organization put some fairly simple, maybe not a rule how to set the minimum wage, but, but the, in line with Jan's comment, just look on the distribution and then on something. Check this or do something. Please verify if. I think that that, that could be very helpful, even for countries which are, let's say, developed like Poland, which where the discussion is strictly political. Thank you.